Thank you so much, Troy, and thank you for this magnificent conference. It's really an honor to be invited to share with you all. I feel like I'm standing among giants, and I'm not so sure I deserve to be here, but I'm really grateful for the opportunity. Uh, and congratulations, Troy, on a job well done, on your award, and to all the other awardees. Congratulations to all of you. Well, if you've never become familiar with my ministry, we'll have a table out back, uh, right out those doors, and you can find out more about us. There are cards out there and information about how you can connect with us if you'd like to do that. But I realize it's probably been a long day, and, and you all are, are ready to hear the concluding uh, remarks, at least the last speaker. And so let me get right to what my assignment is. Uh, I've spoken many places, but I'm a preacher ultimately, so I'm not going to apologize or ask your forgiveness if I end up preaching just a bit. But I want to call your attention to 1 Samuel chapter 30 and a section of verses from 3 to 8. Uh, I'm picking out certain portions for emphasis and in the interest of time. But it says this, So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. This text has touched me in ways I never expected it to. Because sometimes I feel like I've returned to my own country after a long journey and found it in shambles. I find men wanting to be women and women wanting to be men. I find an effort to sexualize children at as early as four years old in our public school systems with the arrogance of believing that parents should be left out of the process and in fact have the process hidden from them of trying to transition a child from one gender to another. If I, God is no longer Welcome in the public square. Last February 2021, when Representative Stubbe of Florida stood on the floor of the House and read some scriptures indicating God's view about homosexuality and transgenderism, indicating that God does not approve it and that it's sin from a scriptural point of view, had Jerry Nadler, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee stand up and say that the will of God is of no concern to this House. Words are being twisted to mean whatever people want them to mean in order to pursue their very perverse agenda. So to stand against these things, so for example, to stand against homosexuality makes you homophobic, to stand against transgenderism makes you transphobic. Right now, the left is up in arms in Florida over a law that simply says you may not approach children ages four through third grade with this effort of sexualization and exposing them to things that they should not be exposed to at their young, tender ages, and particularly not without parental permission and they are up in arms and, and, and just, just absolutely 
calling the governor and the legislature and all of us who would support such a thing to, to protect children, everything but children of God. To stand against Islamic terror makes you Islamophobic. To stand against the Chinese communist dictatorship, which regularly arrests, tortures, imprisons Christians, Muslims, and anybody who dares to speak up in agreement, in disagreement, I should say, with this dictatorial communist regime, to speak against them makes you xenophobic and, of course, racist. Vocabulary has been manipulated so as to categorize Christians as fear mongers and bigots and haters and, and, and people who are, are out to do harm to others when in fact all we're doing is pointing out sin. All we're doing is pointing out the distinction between right and wrong. And I don't know about you, but I am never going to apologize for standing up for what the Word of God tells us. As a matter of fact, we are not condemning anybody. We are warning people. And the Word of God tells us we are, we are obligated, commanded to warn them because their only hope for redemption is understanding the difference between righteousness and sin. And if we don't make that distinction, they have no reason to understand that they are in need of redemption and in need of salvation. I mean, even the word gay, I, I resent the word because the word suppo is supposed to mean happy and carefree and it's now been appropriated and perverted and what it really means is homosexual. But you can't ever say that, you see, because to say that makes you, once again, some kind of homophobe. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the suicide rates among homosexuals and transgenders, you know it's anything but happy. It's anything but carefree. And while they would blame society, I would suggest to you that the inner turmoil that's created when people not only rebel against God's moral law, but against his natural law, is what is causing them to, to self-destruct from within. So it's anything but gay. It's anything but happy. It's anything but carefree. The Word of God says the way of the transgressor is hard, and it is. You know, I ran for lieutenant governor of Virginia, won the nomination for the Republican Party, and during the time that I campaigned, I had the opportunity to go out to southwest Virginia, and I met a lot of people who are farmers and, and uh, work the land out there because southwest Virginia is the most rural part of the state. And I got into a discussion with a farmer, somebody who had been raised in, South, in Southwest Virginia, raised on a farm, and, and in the course of the conversation, he and I got to talking about our dads. And after a while, we started laughing and saying, you know, I guess our dads knew each other because we shared a common moral vision. This American kid who grew up in the outskirts of Philadelphia in an urban and industrialized working class community and that American who grew up in the rural southwest region of Virginia somehow found that we had so much in common because there was a time when there was a moral consensus in the United States of America. And our dads, though they came from entirely different backgrounds, taught us similar things. Son, you are responsible for your own actions. You must bear the responsibility for your decisions. Work hard. Don't expect anybody to give you anything because the world doesn't owe you anything. Be committed to excellence at whatever you do. Strive to make a difference. Treat others that, the way you would want to be treated. Don't ask others to do for you what you can do for yourself. Remember that you are ultimately answerable to God, so treat others the way you would want to be treated. And yet, and yet, today, all of that consensus seems to have broken down. All I hear against America are negative accusations 
about the nature of our country. We are a white supremacist country. We are a systemically racist country. We are a sexist country. We are a country of social injustice. Well, I want to tell you that you are looking at a kid who was born into poverty, to a broken home, placed in foster care at the age of 14 months old, grew up in the streets of Chester, Pennsylvania, was a member of a gang by the time I was 10, and committing petty crimes. I was an angry kid because I was in foster care and I didn't understand why my parents weren't taking care of me. I rarely saw my mother, saw my father occasionally when he would visit. At the age of 10 years old, something very dramatic happened. I was standing on a street corner one day and my father pulled up in his car, rolled down his window and pointed his finger at me and summoned me over to the car and I walked over and I said, hey dad, and he said, son, you always say you'd like to come live with me. Do you still feel that way? I said, I certainly do. I'd love to come live with you. He said, get in. He took me to my foster home and announced that he was taking custody of his son. And let me tell you, although my foster parents really became almost hysterical at the prospect, because after all, they'd had me from 14 months old, my father said, if I don't take him, we're going to lose him. And he was right. At that point, my heroes were people who had been to the penitentiary. My heroes were people who had gone to jail and come out and they were tough and they were mean and you stepped aside when they walked down the street. Those were the people we were aspiring to be like. And my father said, if I don't take him, we're going to lose him to those streets. And I was failing the fifth grade because I went when I felt like it and my foster parents couldn't control me. But my father got a hold of me and sat me down. I'll never forget my first day with him. He said, son, I want you to know that every day with me can be like a day of heaven on earth. Or every day I will tear your behind all to pieces. <laughs> and I found out he meant it. And that he would do it. But I also went from being an F student in fifth grade to being an A student in sixth grade. I stopped hanging with the gang. That's how I ended up graduating. I don't just didn't graduate from college. I graduated summa cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa. I went on to Harvard Law School. Can you imagine my father with a sixth grade education who spent 33 years as a welder in Sunship Building and Dry Dock Company, watched his son graduate from the top law school in the nation. And so, so my friends, I'm not saying that to brag on myself. I'm saying it to say, when you tell me that America is a white supremacist country and a systemically racist country that won't let black people achieve and won't let minorities achieve, I call you a liar because I am proof positive that America is a great nation. I dare say that if my father and the father, that guy that I was talking to out in Southwest Virginia could come back today, my father passed away, in 2002, they would barely recognize some of the things that they see in our country today and wonder where in the world are we going. They would see demagogues using race to, to, to recreate division and, and segregation and suspicion. They would see descendants of the brave people who fought in World War II and, and pioneered out this country needing crying rooms and safe spaces. They would see freedom being trampled by those who believe that they have such wisdom and superior knowledge that they know what the American people should see and hear and know, and they will censor those who they don't think are providing them with decent information. I am proud to say, by the way, that I have been banned from Twitter and suspended from YouTube. I must be telling the truth. They would see families decimated. They would see government giving away money like candy. They would see the moral climate dis de degenerating into an anything goes mindset. Whatever you want to do, do it. They would see these oligarchs, oligarchs in our country controlling so much, even our electoral process with their billions of dollars. People like Mark Zuckerberg and and George Soros behind the scenes giving money to state election boards in order to try to influence or control the outcome. 
they would see the President of the United States sneering at the idea of freedom when people say, wait a minute, I'm free. I should be able to decide whether I want to take a shot, whether I want to take a treatment or not, not be forced to do it. Freedom now, I don't know whether you've heard this, but we've been told freedom is simply code word now for right-wing extremism. Patriotism has been perverted into a word they're now using that they call hatriotism. So if you love your country as I do, somehow that makes you a hater. And by the flag, the American flag, which I love and honor, because I was in the United States Marine Corps, I raised my hand and took an oath to the Constitution of the United States that I would preserve, protect, and defend it against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That oath never had an expiration date, and I don't mind telling you that when you start denigrating my flag, you're getting on the fighting side of me. And yet, yet that flag is now supposed to represent the right wing or the Republican Party. No, that flag represents the United States of America, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. My wife and I, on Tuesday, were blessed to have our first grandchild. And I'm here to tell you that if they thought I was a tiger for this country before, look out now, because it's very real. I don't want my granddaughter to have to say to people, my grandfather wouldn't recognize this country. My grandfather wouldn't know who we are. I want her to be able to say, my grandfather and those of his generation stood up for America so that we would remain free and prosperous and a nation of hope and opportunity for all people, and I am a beneficiary of that legacy. Well, this is our zigzag, isn't it? I mean, for those of us who expected a different trajectory uh, uh, one based on faith and, and, and freedom and, and family. We can understand why David and the people lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. They wept until they had no more tears to cry. The condition of our country today is enough to make us weep. When we think how far we are, from the way our forefathers thought. I wonder how many of us today in our country are moved by these words that were written by Catherine Bates. Then, I believe at that time when she wrote this, was president of Wesley College, the college that Hillary Clinton graduated from. America the Beautiful. And think about this stanza. Oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved and mercy more than life. America, America, may God thy goal refine, till all success be nobleness and every gain divine. My favorite, I wonder how many Americans are moved today by my country tis of thee. Sweet land of liberty of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride from every mountainside. Let freedom ring. Or that last verse, which is a prayer, our fathers God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might. Great God, our King. We can weep for America because we seem to have come so far from the trajectory that I really believe our founding fathers had in mind and so many who went after them had in mind, who sacrificed blood and sweat and tears and even their lives for the freedom that we now enjoy. So I understand, David, in a sense, the tumult in the camp at Ziglag they wanted to stone David. But that wasn't the end of the story, was it? Because David encouraged himself in the Lord. 
And in the multiple crises we face, my brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you to encourage yourself in the Lord. You see, I really believe that God loves us, and I believe that God loves America because Americans have been seeking God's face in behalf of our country since its inception. From the time the Mayflower Compact was entered into in the name of God and Jesus Christ to the time that John Winthrop landed 10 years later and had a vision of a shining city on a hill to the time that Thomas Jefferson penned the words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To the time that Ben Franklin stood up in the midst of the Constitutional Convention and said, the longer I live, the more convincing proof I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall from the sky without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without its aid? He said, we read in the sacred scriptures, and I believe this, that unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. And I am convinced that without his concurring aid, we will be no more successful in building this house than they were in building the Tower of Babel. God has been in the midst of this nation from the very beginning. And when Dr. King stepped to the Lincoln Memorial to give that famous I Have a Dream speech, he said, my dream is deeply rooted in the American dream. He didn't call for an overthrow of our country. He didn't call for a tossing out of our system. He called for us to simply live up to the values that have been bequeathed to us. He said when the founding fathers wrote the Declaration of Independence, they were writing a check to which every American, not just black Americans, white Americans, but every American would fall heir. And here we are, inheritors of that great legacy. My brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you to stand up for what we've been given. I know there are people who will say, and by the way, my great-grandparents were slaves and sharecroppers in Orange County, Virginia, Gabriel and Eliza Jackson. But I'll tell you something. In spite of the pain, the suffering that they experienced and so many others, I believe that the hand of God was in the process all the time. Because while they could not have imagined it, and while others could not have imagined it perhaps, God knew that the day would come when they and so many others would have descendants like me who would stand up in a, in a place like Virginia, what's the capital of the Confederacy, and have the people of Virginia vote for me to be their lieutenant governor, winning 75% of the counties in that commonwealth. That's who we are as Americans. We've got something worth standing up for. We've got something worth fighting for. When I joined the Marine Corps, I learned the patriotism of duty. But I tell you, once I got saved, my perspective changed. Once I got saved, I no longer saw America as my country to which I owe duty, and I do. I saw America as my beloved nation and a gift to me from Almighty God. Because I don't believe that I'm here by accident, and I don't believe that you're here if you're Irish because of, of the potato famine, or you're Italian because of pogroms, or if you're German because of, of the, 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 the wars that were happening uh, in Prussia at that time. I believe that every one of us is here by divine appointment, that God brought us together here for a purpose that he knew. The Bible says he, had made, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and determine our pre-appointed times and the boundaries of our dwellings. America is a providential nation. And you and I are assigned to be here. You know, no other nation on earth looks as much like the kingdom of God as we do. You can move to China, but you can't become Chinese unless you are Chinese. You can even move to France, but that doesn't make you French. 
But people from all over the world, practically every continent and nation on earth, have come here and become Americans. Americans. There's something special about that. It's like the kingdom of God. And I really believe this. America belongs to God. America was ordained by God. America has his hand. God has his hand on the United States of America. And I believe this. Nobody can take this country down or take it away if we Americans will stand up for it. If we Christians will stand up for it. God will help us. God will empower us. God will enable us. And he already is. Because I had friends who told me that what happened in Virginia in this past election wasn't going to happen. But it did. It did. I had people tell me, what's the point of voting? They're going to cheat their way into victory anyway. But we won anyway. Because the people who know their God are strong and carry out great, great exploits. And by the way, I don't know whether you all are aware of this, but we elected in the three constitutional offices that we have not held in Virginia in 10 years a Christian governor, a Christian lieutenant governor, and a Christian attorney general. So David asked God, he said, well, seeing the carnage, seeing what had happened there, their wives and their children caught up in, the, in the, the assault, just as our country is, our young people decimated by this indoctrination that they're undergoing in our colleges and universities and often our public schools. But David went to God and said, should I pursue? And God says, pursue. You shall surely overtake them and recover all. See, I believe God was saying, David, I haven't given you all this for the devil to take it away from you. I haven't given you all of this to have it decimated. That's not my will. That's not my plan. You rise up. You stand up. You go after what I've given you, and you seek to take it back. And I'm here to tell you, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to take back everything the devil's tried to steal in this country, and we're going to restore America to the foundational principles and truths that made us the greatest nation in human history. And that is not bragging. That's giving God the glory. Because, look, I'm convinced of this. If God was willing to spare Sodom and Gomorrah, if he found just 10 righteous, you cannot tell me that God will not look upon our country with mercy knowing that there are millions across this nation crying out to God in behalf of the United States of America. I mean, look, I don't know everything, and you, some preachers out here that I profoundly admire who probably know a lot more than I do, but I know this, God answers prayer. God answers prayer. And the word of God says in Psalm 2.8, Ask of me and I will give you nations and the ends of the earth for your inheritance. And you can't tell me that if we're praying for America, God is turning a deaf ear. It may seem like a long time, but I'm convinced of this. There is going to be another great awakening in the United States of America. God is going to turn the hearts of our countrymen back toward him. This is our legacy, my brothers and sisters. This is who we are. And the Bible says in Romans 11:29 29 that the gifts and calling of God are without revocation. In other words, if we don't abdicate... God certainly will not go back on his promises to us. And he said, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open. And we are fasting, we are praying, we are seeking. My organization has a prayer call every Friday at noon. And people from all over the country call in with one purpose, praying for America. So don't you dare get discouraged. Don't you dare think that we're losing. Don't you dare think we can't win elections and we can't bring the country together because we've gone so far. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. Nothing gets past God. The Bible says his eyes go to and fro throughout the earth seeking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal to him. So if our hearts are set on him, God hears us and answers our prayer and we will see an awakening in our country. 
So don't say, and I know there are some who will prophesy this, and you have to forgive me if I stand in disagreement that America's going to be judged by God and it's over already and God's already judged America. Have you not known, have you not heard that the Lord, the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not faint, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. For even the youth shall faint and be weary. Young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So though I may feel sometimes like I've been on a long journey and come back to find my country in a shambles, I'll tell you what I'm doing. I am picking up the pieces. I am determined to restore what has been lost, what has been damaged. I am not going to allow the devil to win over my beloved nation. This is my legacy. This is my country. I am not an African American. I am an American. This is what God has made me. And I'm going to defend my country no matter what they say about me, no matter what they call me, no matter how much they kick me off or try to censor me from the various venues. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an army should encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock, and now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O oh Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy upon me and help me. For when you said, seek my face, my heart said, your face, Lord, will I seek. My brothers and sisters, if God be for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Listen, I've read the front, the middle, and the back of the book, and we win. So I'm not quitting. I'm not laying down. I'm not backing up. I'm going all the way to victory because there's victory in Jesus, my Savior, forever. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America forever.